here we go. Mike Boyle, thank you so much for doing that interview with me. Um, first question, would you agree that back and neck problem figures in Western societies are rising mainly because of bad movement patterns and bad posture? I would agree with that. I think we've become much more sedentary, much more seated. I mean, there's a lot of, there's books out there now, sitting kills. There's a lot of people really talking about how bad sitting is for us, how we don't move, how, you know, we talked today in my talk just about creep, the idea of, you know, the continuous stress on tissues of being in any posture, but obviously for us it's seated posture, it's forward head, it's flexed hips, it's rounded, you know, rounded lumbar spine, rounded thoracic spine. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, if you can come up with another explanation, I guess you got to <laughs> let me know. I will, I will. <laughs> um, Second question, does our med medical system in the Western world offer reasonable solutions to treat the causes of back pain and what were false exercise recommendations given to patients in the past? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, if you've got, I mean, you know, crunches for, yeah. make, your, make your front stronger, your back will get better. Right? That was the simplistic right. process that we had. Um, flexion exercises, if you go back here, you know, the Williams flexion, you know, knees to chest, that kind of stuff, stretch your back. I and mean, I think what we've realized now that even though the pain is in the back, I think most of the solution is is in the hips and in better movement patterns. So when we think about getting people to be able to move their hips better, to use their glutes better, those are the things that are going to solve their back problem. I don't necessarily think that a back problem is as much a back problem as it is, as you said, a postural problem, a movement problem, that if you get people moving more, sitting less, moving their hips more, strengthening their glutes up. There's all these things that you need to do that are going to make people healthier. But I always said the, the medical system has three, I call it the three eyes. You know, ingest, take, eat something, you know, to take this pill, inject, take a shot, incise, cut. You know what I mean? And that's, you know, if you go to a doctor, first time you go, you'll get the pills. Second time you go, you'll get an injection. Third time you go, you'll get, hey, let's operate. Yeah. That's that's the system. That's the way the system works. So I always tell people, De never go back three times. No. You can go twice, but don't go three times. <laughs> and because I mean, sometimes anti-inflammatory medication will help. Sometimes an injection will help. I'm not a, I'm not a surgery fan at, at any stretch. But I, you know, I've seen so many horrible outcomes with you know with back surgeries with fusions. I have seen some disectomies that have actually worked well, and some people have gotten better. But I still think even with a disectomy, that's not you're treating the symptom, that's the problem. Yeah, right, totally agree. Um, what roughly is the percentage of people that could get their back problems fixed with exercise and soft tissue work? And what percentage needs other help from doctors, psychologists, etc.? I, mean, I think in the beginning, most everyone's gonna benefit from, a, in my mind, from a good physical therapist. A good physical therapist who understands backs is gonna be your biggest key. And then a good trainer who understands backs is gonna be the next step. I tend to not, it is rare that I would recommend anybody with back pain see a doctor. Okay. I will generally send them to a physical therapist because again, and Dr. Bird who spoke yesterday talked about that, in the medical community they're, they're not that interested in things they can't operate. And maybe Germany is different, I'm not sure, but in our US economy, physical therapists are going to do the rehabilitation, they're going to try to get you better without surgery because that's what they do, but in general, if you go to a quote unquote back specialist, usually that back specialist is a surgeon. And that's what surgeons do. Surgeons do surgery. So I think to me, I want to, I want to, if I can keep my clients away from those people, I'd like to. Since mobility restrictions, especially in the hip, like you mentioned, and thoracic spine can be causes of back and neck problems, how important is the role of stretching these areas and would you recommend more static or dynamic stretching? I, I think the, Stretching is critical and I think it's a combination of both. I don't think there is an, an answer like just static stretching. I think even with stretching, you've got to do the right stretches the right way. There's so much, it's so, in my mind, even with the warm-up and mobility stuff. Generally, if the human body is kind of a path of least resistance machine and it will generally do things wrong before right. <laughs> yeah. So without really good coaching and really good instruction, people won't, they won't stretch well. And they won't do their mobility work correctly. They'll try. That's why I'm not a fan, a homework fan. I like I like to see people do stuff. Because a lot of times when they when they get away from you and they go do it, they just lapse back into their compensatory pattern, which is not the one that you want. Yeah. But still, if you would tell your clients three simple exercises to do every day at home to, to prevent them from getting back problems, what would they be? 
Well, if you're talking about prevention, I yeah. think then you're talking about hip mobility. Yeah. So I would say to my clients, you know, I need you to to stretch. I need you to, you know, I need you to do some, you know, some dynamic hip mobility drills. That, you know, I need you to bridge. I need you to, you know, what McGill calls a bird dog. What we're calling, you know, quadruped ops and crawl in place. It's all the same exercise. And so I think those two are two of the big. I think out of McGill's two big three, I'm not a curl up fan. So if you said three, I'd be like a, a bridging exercise, a quadruped exercise, and a plank exercise. That's what I want. And maybe maybe side plank before front plank. But I'd almost go to four and say, okay, these would be the four. If we were looking at that baseline beginner level, right. Right. Um, and how important are breathing exercises for people with back and neck pain? I think that's the next frontier. I'm starting to think really important. Yeah. But I think even more probably neck than back, to be perfectly honest, mm -hmm. because I, obviously I think it's important in the back because we're starting to understand the role of the diaphragm and the role of the deep abdominal muscles as muscles of exhalation. Yeah. But also we're starting to see, I think a lot of neck pain comes from when people do have flawed breathing patterns and they become chest breathers, you know, right. with apical breathing, you know, the idea that now I'm breathing with my scalenes, with my sternocleidomastoids, and with my traps. Of course, I'm going to think about that. Well, of course you're going to have neck pain. Yeah. Because as I said, you've switched, we said in today's lecture, you've switched a pump up here. Mm -hmm. You know, suddenly this is what's pumping the air in and out when it's supposed to be nose, you know, it's supposed to be occurring down in your, in your belly. Yeah. And suddenly we've created that exchange spot right. higher up in the neck, and suddenly you know you've got scapulothoracic muscles doing what abdominal muscles are supposed to be doing. It's right. not going to work. Right. Okay. Um, last question: What role plays a proper diet for people with back pain? That's another thing I, I probably would have said if you'd asked me that two days ago. I would have said it's not that big a deal. And now I listen to Dr. Seaman yeah. talk, and you start listening. And, you know, I mean, we know so much. We hear about inflammation all the time, but. Dr. Seaman, for whatever reason, really kind of hit me over the head with it yesterday. And I think sometimes we get so focused on trying to help our client from a mechanical standpoint that we forget about the chemical standpoint. And I think that the diet is the chemical part of the equation. And we don't know. I mean, I can't tell you that 10% of somebody's pain is chemical. But I'm going to tell you that I think it's much higher than 10%. It might be 20, it might be 30. And if you can get somebody to clean up their diet, lose weight, because again, you see with a lot of your, I have a back pain patient that I work with right now, and he's a very, he's a puffy looking, and that's the best way I can describe it. And I looked, you know, I was thinking about him when I was here this weekend, this week, I gotta go back, I gotta get him to lose 20 pounds, I gotta, yeah. and I've gotta start to monitor his diet. So I think it's, a, you know, when you start looking, I think breathing and diet are gonna be two areas that we're gonna realize will become a much bigger part of our dealing with back pain than maybe they were a year ago, six months ago, three months ago. Well, so that's the future to really integrate all different parts. Exactly, right? that so, is the future. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. No problem.